so aimless, life filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light. Oh, good. I'm glad I made somebody feel good. Okay, there's mistakes on the announcements, and I wrote them, so it's my fault. Um, we have, of course, all the services provided that it doesn't snow for a while. We get to do Wednesday. <laughs> so be here, because Pastor Busey will be preaching, and it'll be a barn burner, and we're really looking forward to that. <laughs> Okay, we have Bible studies, Arlette's Bible study Monday at 10 o'clock at her home. Listen, if you have time and you're not busy with something else, you need to get into these Bible studies. They're really good for you, and it's fellowship, and it's teaching, and it's if you need loved on, you get loved on. It's just wonderful time in the Lord. Grub and grow for the men. Um, my husband didn't want to go at first to those, but now he wouldn't, he wouldn't miss. So, <laughs> hey, try it. You'll like it. Healing school is down here for February 2nd, but that's wrong because we missed healing school last Thursday. We will have healing school this Thursday with Pastor Busey. If you are one of those people who needs healing and you're available, we should always be feeding on healing scriptures all the time, constantly. How do you keep your health? How do you keep your youth? How do you keep it? How do you keep your energy? You feed on the word of God, and this is an opportunity to do that, so don't miss it. And there's coffee, and there's always something to munch on, so hey, it's great fun. The adult Bible study class will be again next Sunday. Healthy living for those of you who are struggling with weight issues or health issues. We talk about food and habits, just healthy living habits to in keep your body in a good atmosphere, keep good food in your body, and it's a just a healthy reminder, and that's at 5 o'clock in the evening. And again, we always have something to munch on, so if you're missing your supper hour, you won't starve. Okay, uh, coming events. Um, Pastor John will be back sometime next week, but if you need any pastoral help, call Pastor Busey. The Valentine Banquet is Saturday, February 11th. 
the menu, it looks so yummy. Baked steak, chicken florentine, cheesy scallop potatoes, green beans, toss salad roll, dessert bar. Tickets are sixteen fifty. Wow, that's high. No, it's not. I saw an ad in the paper this last week for somebody's having a dinner and it was thirty eight dollars. So you get a very good meal for sixteen fifty once a year. That wonderful fellowship and we'll have uh, Marvin and Leah Yoder will be speaking, and if you look at that picture, it says a lot. This is a couple that's been around ministry, and, and they know the score, and they look like they're happy with each other, so hey, <laughs> it looks like a real blessing. Uh, one thing that's not on the announcement is next Sunday is Cowboy Sunday. What's yeehaw. Cowboy Sunday? Yeah, yeehaw. Cowboy Sunday means you get to wear your jeans. You get to wear your flannel shirts. You get to wear your 10-gallon hat, but take it off during service. Okay. <laughs> it is Cowboy Sunday. Cowboy boots, <laughs> jeans, flannel shirts. Uh, open carry. Yeah, no. No <laughs> open carry. <laughs> Leave your open carry in your uh, horse and buggy outside. Okay. <laughs> So Cowboy Sunday, and we, you, it's a fifth Sunday, and usually we have um, potluck, but we're not going to make you bring food, but you can dress very comfortably. Okay, our missions project is Larry and Angela Keaton. I believe they're in Poland now. They ministered in that part of the world, and they have definitely been keeping up with what's going on in Ukraine, and they're helping them, plus they do services in the United States. And I just read their newsletter recently, and they are seeing miracles. They are seeing miracles in their service, so it's a good one. And I believe they're going to come to our church sometime this year. So sow into them now, and, and you get a reap from that when they come. Um, I don't know if you bothered to read the Prayer for America, but if you would join us in Prayer for America, it's on the back of your sheet. We do this in, on Sunday mornings before the service, so you have it on your announcements, and if you will pray with us when we go home. We're believing for revival in all of America. And <sighs> miracles are starting to fall like raindrops, people. This is, the move is on. It's on right now. Okay, you may greet one another with a hug or a handshake. Um, don't hug somebody who doesn't want it. But, <laughs> but you're free to greet each other.
because we don't have Pastor John to hold us back today, so we can get going, right? <laughs> Kidding. All right, praise the Lord. This is our opportunity to give this morning, amen? just want to encourage you, if you're giving this morning, just mark your envelope real plain, and uh, we're going to give above and beyond our... Kathy said earlier, Larry and Angela Keaton are our mission project for the month of January. And uh, what an exciting time. I don't know how excited it is for them to be there, but I'm sure they're excited that they're in Poland to uh, – they're right in the mix of all that stuff that's going on. So I'm sure they need support and help and encouragement. And uh, um, it's a crazy world out there. Amen? So uh, – all right, well, um, just a quick comment. The worst day for me for preparing for a message is usually the day after. Because then I think about all the all the stuff like, oh, why didn't I say that? Or why did I say that? Or this or that. And anyway, so one thing I didn't say that I wanted to say was um, we're living in a time of urgency, not in fear, not in, you know, like, oh, what's going to happen? But in urgency of we got we got a lot to get done. We got a lot to get done, and we're not getting it done like we should. So uh, I just encourage you to, you know, like this is offering time. But I encourage you to really pay attention to what you're giving and how you're giving. Um, I listened to a guy speak at a meeting this last week. Um, he he's the Kansas City Wolf. He's their mascot for Kansas City, and uh, he had a tremendous uh, message. And all he would have had to done is give a sal mes salvation message at the end of it, and it would have been complete. But, you know, it was at a tree guy thing, so he, he wasn't going to do that. But but he was, it was really good, it was a, and he really ministered a lot. And he had, he had a book, and uh, he, gave, he basically selling the book for a fundraiser. But uh, he's supporting I don't know how many different missions, like in Africa and di in different countries in the world, helping – give, you know, and, and the scripture he gave was the one where it says to help widows and orphans is what your ministry needs to be, is basically what it was saying. And that's, so that was his theme uh, as far as his book goes and stuff like that. But he's got an interesting story. I'll have to tell you s some more about it sometime. But um, so my, my encouragement would be uh, live with a sense of urgency that we can do all that God wants us to do because times are short. Or if you listen to the Stuff that's going on the uh, the big climate thing that they're having together over there and across the sea and it's like oh my goodness Al Gore says that the ocean is going to boil it's going to turn going to be boiling so it's so <laughs> yeah exactly so uh, you know and, the, and then by 2000 like just in just in a few years where the world's going to end and and it might you know it depends on what Jesus says but. But uh, anyway, so uh, my encouragement to you is to get from your heart, be awake, don't be in fear, be awake, be ready, be, be listening, have eyes to hear, and, and eyes to hear, right? No, <laughs> eyes to see. <laughs> you didn't even catch that, did you? <laughs> uh, eyes to see and ears to hear. There we go. Be awake. All right, be ready. Okay, so scripture for that. And I thought this is really good. Second Corinthians 8, 7. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in your love, and in our love for you, see that you excel in the act of grace also. Be full of grace. You know, we want to be full of faith. We want to be full of word. But this is saying, be full of grace, you know, and be be encouraging, be merciful, be loving to others around you, and just be awake to see what you can do. You can minister in so many ways, and like I said last week, this doesn't give you the. This is not the position of ministry. The position of ministry is you guys doing your job, because yeah, pastor gets to preach, pastor John gets to preach, whatever. That's important, but if we're doing our job, we're coming here to get filled up and get encouraged. To go out and do our job out there. Amen? So that's what I want to encourage you with this morning. All right, so let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today and thank you for your word and the truth. Thank you, Father, for all that you have for us and all that you're doing for us. Help us to be awake.
Help us be attentive. Help us to hear and see the things you want us to see and hear. And Lord, we just thank you again for all that you're doing for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's do our confession. As I tithe and give offering, I'm leaving you, Lord, for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits and promotions, sales and commissions, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, discounts and dividends, checks in the mail, gifts and survivors, bills decreased, bills paid off, questions and answers, and greater victories than this to greater loss. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all my needs. I have more than enough to give from what the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.
I feel within Redeeming what was lost and all that could have been Oh, this is the healing kind of love You are the truest friend Staying through the night when I was at my end Comforting my heart till it was light again Oh, this is a faithful kind of love Everlasting Father
this next song we're gonna sing in Spanish. It's real simple and uh, powerful because it says, your faithfulness is great. Your faithfulness is incomparable. No one like you, blessed God, great is your faithfulness. Let me sing it. We love you so much. You're so beautiful. 
make you so beautiful, every part about you. We want to be like you. We want to be like you in every area of our life so that we're like magnets to the world. They see you through us. They see God through us. What we do, what we say, how we, how we conduct ourselves. Oh, Lord, Lord, my cry is that people fall in love with you, deeply in love with you, to where they're just, just so in, in you, they can hardly stand it. That is our cry, Lord, because that's when things begin to get done. That's when we get that zeal. That's when we get all that stuff on the inside of us that just wants to burst and let the bursting go all over the place because we love you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This may seem kind of funny, but, you know, when you fell in love, whether it was for the first time or, or you fall in love with somebody and you just go bonkers, I can't remember that. I mean, I'm old, but yet I can still remember falling in love, you know, and falling all over myself because I was so in love. That's how God wants us to be with him, that we're just so in love with him that we want to be such a part of everything that's going on. So hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you all. You may be seated. Well, I heard from Pastor John. And he is so excited. He, um, he was very emotional because he says, I'm walking on the very streets that Jesus walked on. And he was so excited about it and everything and got baptized in the Jordan River just like Jesus did. And so he was really thrilled and excited. And we ought to be thrilled and excited for him, you know? It's a great thing that this church did. It's been his desire most of his life to go to Israel. He just wanted to, to make that trip, and uh, he, he did. And our church, that was our church's appreciation, pastor's appreciation for him. We sent him to Israel. This church has been so absolutely wonderful to their pastors all through the years, taking such good care of them. It's just, it's been wonderful. And uh, I'm a part of it. Being the first pastor, you know, you took such good care of me. Made sure that even the associate pastors would get to Oklahoma or get to these conventions and things that we would go to. Because, see, pastors give out all the time. They need to, to receive something. And you spend the money to send us to these conferences so we get built up and come back and let you all have it. Yeah. Amen. That's what you need. Y'all need it. Well, I'll need to give it to you. Amen. Praise God. So I'm so blessed, and he's so blessed, and it's exciting, real exciting. So praise the Lord. I've got some exciting news. I'm going to be another great, well, I'm not another. I'm going to have another great grandbaby. Guess who that is? Alana. Alana. <laughs> Amen. She called to tell Grammy that. And I was so excited because I've been praying for her. So this is an exciting time. I've got three great-grandchildren, and now I will have four great-grandchildren. Amen. And three grandchildren. So praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, you know me. I like to tell stories things that I read about, things that I've experienced during my many years of ministry. We won't say how many, but, you know, all of this time. And, and uh, I like to think that these true stories, well, they're true stories. Um, and um, I don't know how many times you've heard them. Uh, I remember when uh, we went to school, Brother Hagen would tell all these stories over and over and over again. And some of the students would not show up. And my son-in-law and I would just uh, wonder, what's going on here? And, and we talked to some of them, and they'd say, well, we've heard these stories over and over again. And Alan and I would look at each other and say, my goodness, I could hear these stories a thousand times and still want to hear more. 
Because, you know, each time it's told, a little bit more is added, or, or uh, it's wonderful to hear all of these things. And so, um, you know, I'll probably repeat myself. If you've heard some of these things, you can do anything you want. You can shut your ears, or you can uh, just say, oh, I've heard that before. Or you can listen and get something more out of it. It's your decision. Do what you want to do. But, you know, these stories encourage people especially when it's of faith, when it's of power, when it's what we believe in. This is important. So um, I remember when my granddaughter, Alana, graduated from Ramah. I'll, I'll never forget this. Uh, during the ceremony at the Civic Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, Pastor Hagen called a young girl up to the pulpit in this big, huge Civic Center and wanted her to give a testimony. Now, I don't know how many of you were there, if any of our church people were there to see her graduate, but she stepped up to the pulpit, and that testimony completely changed my life at that moment. It was wonderful. She began to tell us how she took a plane. She was either coming home uh, from Rama or going to home uh, during a, a break, a Christmas break or something like that, and she had been flying on the plane for a while. And um, all of a sudden, the pilot made an announcement uh, that in a while, they were planning on landing, but the landing gear would not go down. It would not go down. And he explained the seriousness of it, and they were to prepare themselves, and the stewardess would help them, and it might be pretty dangerous. And you could see people panic just set in. People were picking their, phone cells, their cell phones up and, and uh, trying to call their families and, and get all this arranged, you know. And you could just feel, she said, despair and everything breaking up. The whole atmosphere. And so she asked the stewardess, she says, could you tell me where the landing gear is? And the stewardess said, well, I think. I think, ma'am, it's under your feet. She says, under my feet? The devil's under my feet. So she, she says, devil, she says, landing gear, come down in Jesus' name. I command it with the name of Jesus. I have authority in the name of Jesus. Guess what? The landing gear came down. Everybody was clapping, and oh, they were having, so, oh, it was wonderful. That girl in her 20s, stepped on top of a chair and started preaching the gospel to all these people. And she got nearly all of them saved on that plane. Can you not see that? I mean, that blessed me so much. And, uh, you know, she got back to school or wherever she was going to, and the, air, uh, the airport was trying to reach her a couple um, months later. They said they had a letter for her. And could she pick it up? So she went and, and um, picked this letter up. And, and like I say, you know, I remember this. I had a pamphlet on this one time. It was published. I couldn't find it. So I'm just giving to you what I remember. I could be exaggerating a little bit, you know, or maybe leaving some things out. But I know I remember the important things. But she read the letter. And it was either from... It was a diplomat, a foreign person, a very important person that was on the plane that day. And he said, young lady, I want you to know I have been a miserable, horrible person all of my life. I have never had peace in my life, ever. I have tried every religion I could get my hands on to get peace. But that day, you stood on that chair and you preached about Jesus. I accepted him into my heart. And I am the happiest man in the world and my family. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that exciting? That girl had boldness. Don't you want boldness like that? Oh, that just thrilled me. That thrilled me. I love it. You know, I know right now, Tim was talking about this. The world's kind of in a mess. It's fear is going around. There's just so much fear and disillusionment and discouragement going around. Christians should not be discouraged. I don't care what's going on around you. 
You should not be discouraged. I hear people say things like, I don't know who to vote for. I don't know what to do anymore. I don't know this. I don't know that. Well, you should. I'll tell you something. Don't get into discouragement. Face things head on. When you need to know something, God will show it to you. At the last minute, you have to have that faith and that trust in God that he will put you where he wants you to be and he'll have you say what he wants you to say. Your part is step out and do it. That's your part. That's important. We have to learn that. You know, uh, I can remember uh, I was in, uh, in uh, Pennsylvania for almost two years. I went there because my family all lives there. But I just hated it there, so I came back here to Superior. But I remember I came back in October of, of 2021, and I can remember one of the first sermons that I preached when I came back was, God's got your back. Remember that? And I say that all of the time, and it's true. God's got your back. And um, he told me that one time when I was going through a few things. He says, I've got your back. I've got your back, and I said, oh, good, Lord, I'm so glad, and because I remember sometimes um, I don't always hug you like I would like to, maybe, uh, because uh, when you grab me and hug me, it throws me off balance a little bit. I you know my, my grandson in Pennsylvania one time, he, he loves to run up to Grammy, and he'll go and he'll hug me, and he knocked me over one time, and my son-in-law was behind me and caught me. So, uh, you know, I think of having you know, having God have my back, and I think about this, that no matter what, he has your back, no matter what you get into. But you know, this month, Tony Cook's newsletter said something like that, and I thought that was so interesting when God started putting this message in my heart. I got this newsletter, and it was awesome, and he said, he made the statement in the newsletter that God's got us covered in that need. He said, God is for you, God is with you, he's in you, he's upon you, he's beside you, he's beneath you, he goes before you. And then I shouted, because he said, he is your rear guard. And I thought, glory to God, he's got my back. And if he's got my back, he's got all of your backs, right? He has your back, that's the way he is. Oh, Lord. I thought, Tony Cook knows that too. <laughs> God told that too. But I never could find a scripture for it. But guess what? In the newsletter, Tony Cook, the scripture was Isaiah 52, 12 in the New Living Testament. And God says, you will not leave in a hurry, running for your lives, for the Lord will go ahead of you. Yes, the God of Israel will protect you from behind. And then the New King James Version says, the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Isn't that neat? We need to look ahead with joy. I don't care what's going on. You know, I know sometimes that's hard, and, but many times you have to put your feelings down and just go for it. Go for it anyway. And then once you go for it, then the feelings will come. And, and things like that will come. But it's up to us to step out in faith. Refuse to be discouraged. Refuse to be lonely. Refuse to be some of these things that the devil tries to put on you. The decision is really up to you. He can't make you do anything. It's your choice. You either give in or you let go and let God. That's the most important thing. Uh, there's a... Uh, Gary Chapman, I don't know if any of you remember him, a Christian leader uh, back in the 70s and 80s. But um, he made a statement, a quote. He said, don't mess up each day with yesterday. And then he went on to say, stop bringing into today the failure of yesterday and in so doing pollute a perfectly wonderful day. And so what he means by that is you're depressed and worried about world situations or anything, in this day, you bring it into the next day, you bring it into the next day, and then by the end of the week, you're a mess. So don't bring that into the next day. Stop it before it gets to the next day. Realize what you're doing. Realize that you have the power to stop it. Nobody else sometimes but you can stop it. 
It's up to you to stop it. So we're to be bolder than bold. That's the way it is. Amen? So that's the title of my message. Making yourself boldly available. You're to make yourself boldly available. And when that girl finished that testimony, that, I mean, that place went wild. They clapped, they laughed, they cried. It was wonderful, totally wonderful. I was so touched by that testimony. And I got to thinking, that's how God wants us to be. He wants to, to boldly step out. Now, I know that hurts your comfort zone. I realize that. Many of us, it's really not our nature. God doesn't expect us to be what we just, you know, aren't made to be. But yet he expects us to take chances. Step out. Be more interesting. You know, quit being in your rut all the time. Sometimes I feel like I'm in a rut with this stupid walker. <laughs> you know, you, you want to step out. And Arlen understands. And, uh, you know, you want to scream. You want to do a little bit of this and that. Just keep going and keep after it. Keep going. That's what I think. I tell people, I'm 85, but I'm still alive. <laughs> that, that's what's so important. You know, it's important. We just keep on going. You know, uh, in Psalm 69, 9, I don't remember what translation that was, but it says, my love for you has my heart on fire. My love for God has my heart on fire. That's how it should be. We should be so in love with him. Now, maybe some of you think this is strange and weird, but you can't do that because God is God. I want to know him inside and out. He knows me inside and out, but I want to get to know him in a deeper way. We want to go deeper, deeper, and deeper. I don't care how old you get. You know, you may not be able to move around a lot, but you can sure pray. You can go deeper with him. This is important. According to W.E. Vine's Expository Dictionary of the New Testament words, to be bold means to dare to do. Noah's Webster's Dictionary of 1868 uses the word courageous as the meaning of bold. And so uh, some translations say of boldness, be of good courage. The Bible says be discouraged. Uh, it says, uh, no, the Bible never says be discouraged. It says be encouraged. And then when, th when things don't seem to be working out, well, you know, quit looking at the things. Don't go by what you see or by what you hear because that's not always right. It's by faith. We go by what we believe, not by what we feel, by what we hear. We go by faith, the faith that's inside of us, and, and we appreciate that. I remember when I healed of cancer in 1987, I had Hodgkin's disease, and the lumps were in my neck and underneath my arm, a seven-centimeter tumor in my lung, and... Uh, and I had a miracle. An angel of the Lord came, walked through the wall of the church and pointed at me when an evangelist prayed for me. And um, I was totally healed. Everything disappeared. But you know, you're, you're so used to living with that for a while. And after I was healed, I would periodically start feeling around, you know. One day my daughter says, Mother, stop that. She says, it's all gone. Why would you want to keep it going? And I said, oh, okay. So... You need to listen to your kids every now and then. And then you don't need to listen to your kids every now and then. <laughs> it's one or the other. Proverbs 28, 1 in the King James says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are as bold as lions. The New Living Testament says, The wicked run away when no one is chasing them, but the godly are bold as lions. And the Voice Bible says, The wicked run away even when no one is chasing them. The right living, however, stand their ground as boldly as lions. And you know, when I was reading my Bible one day in the Passion Bible, I was in the Passion Bible, and I was, had such a burden for Ukraine, and I was praying for Ukraine. And in Psalm 37, 34, it says, You'll watch with your own eyes and see the wicked lose everything. I said, Glory to God. Ukraine, did you hear that? You know, that's a word from the Lord. Just keep on going. Keep on doing what you're doing. And they're going to go down. They'll go down. And that's what God wants. He wants the righteous to rise up and those that are good to go on. And he puts the evil down. 
And that's something we've got to remember. Also in Psalm 1016 in the New Living Testament, and it says the godless nation will ba- nations will vanish from the land. Instead of being discouraged and upset, take that word that godless nations will vanish from the land. You concentrate on that. Don't be discouraged. Don't concentrate on the bad stuff. Concentrate on what the word is saying about things. That's important. You know what? I remember one time, um, now I lost my train of thought. We'll go on here. (laughs) You know, we can pray for boldness and God will honor it. It may not be in some of our makeup, but still, you can do that. It's a decision. You can step out. Um, Did you know that it does no good to pray for righteousness because you're already righteous? According to the word of God, the moment you became born again, you became the righteousness of God in Christ. So therefore, you can't pray to be righteous. You can't pray for faith. Because the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. So we speak it and we hear it and we step out in it. We can't pray for faith, but we can pray for boldness. Because the moment you were uh, born again, you were given the measure of faith. Everybody was given the same measure, but it's what you do with it. What are you going to do with that measure that you got? You're going to leave it lay? You're going to leave it dormant? You're going to stay weak? No. You grab hold of God's word. You speak it out of your mouth, and you grow your faith. This is important. Amen. You cannot get faith by going through problems. A lot of people think that. A lot of Christians think that that's how they get strong in the Lord, is by going through all these problems. Well, I'll tell you something. If problems make your faith grow, then the body of Christ should be faith giants. Because, you know, that's the devil is the one that brings those tests and those trials. And we've got to stand up against them. And it's only when you take the promises of God and apply them to the test, apply, uh, apply them to the problems in your life, that that is how a lot of times your faith will be encouraged when we do things like that. Uh, also, we don't need to pray for power. If you're filled with the Holy Ghost in Acts 1.8, it says you should, be, um, you should receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So you shouldn't have to pray for that. You shouldn't have to pray for faith or power because it's already there. Now, what are you going to do about it? In Acts 4.13 in the Voice Bible, it says, Now the leaders were surprised and confused. These are the Jewish leaders. They looked at Peter and John and realized they were typical peasants. Peter and John were preaching to the crowds. They were typical peasants, uneducated, utterly ordinary fellows with extraordinary confidence. Leaders recognized them as companions of Jesus because they had extraordinary confidence It's who you hang with sometimes will show what's in you, will show. you got to be careful who you hang with all the time because you're going to show what you're made of by who you hang with. And then it goes on to say, they took knowledge of them, of who, of Peter and John, that they had been with Jesus. It was obvious they were with the King of kings and Lord of lords, acting like him, walking like him, saying what he said. And this is important. This is what the world is looking for in us Christians. Do we act, talk, live like we've been with Jesus, or are we just like everybody else in the world? That girl in that plane had confidence, had tremendous confidence. We need boldness so people can see that we've been with Jesus. We need boldness to proclaim that we have a powerhouse on the inside of us. We need boldness inside of us, and we can pray for that. Hebrews 4.16 in the Voice Bible says, Well, let us step boldly to the throne of grace where we can find mercy and grace to help in a time of need. No, it says in the Voice Bible, it says throne of grace where we can find mercy and grace to help when we need it the most. That's what I like about this. In the church that I was brought up in as a child, we were kind of taught like that verse meant we back up to the throne of grace, kind of meekly and lowly and scared and that we're going to get swatted if we say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. You know, that's kind of how I was brought up in. 
and uh, you're so worthy. You sang these unworthy songs. I'm just an old beggar roaming around in the in the desert and the valleys and all of this and that. You remember that. Some of you were brought up like that, and this is not good. We are not wimps. Are you a wimp? No. I'm not a wimp. And you know, we read in Psalm 22, 6, Jesus is on the cross and all the misery and agony that he's going through on the cross, and he's speaking of himself, and, and people take this as he's just lowly and awful and poor and unable to help himself. He says, but I'm a worm and no man, a reproach of men and uh, despised of the people. He's talking about what he's going through, and he went through all of that stuff on the cross so we wouldn't have to go through it. He took it all on himself so we wouldn't have to go. And then Christians take that as him being so lowly and so poor and so this and that. Do you know what that word worm means in the Hebrew? It's called a tola worm. It's one of the most expensive worms ever. They bred them by the thousands and thousands and thousands and they would squash them, and they would, it's like a dye, and they would dye the robes of the kings and the priests in this scarlet, beautiful color. And that's how priceless it was. Jesus is priceless. He's especially priceless to us. Think of what he took on that cross. Think of what he bore. Think of the blood that he shed. He did it all for us. He bought us back from the devil. He did that for us. He went through all of that for us. He, he came and lived as a human being. He, he dethroned himself. How, how do you say that? He came from heaven where he had it so good, and he came to live like us so that he could show us how to live eventually. And he wants us to be bold. Isaiah 43, 26 says, Put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. God's talking to us like that. Some translations say, well, argue. Argue with God? That's what it says. The Voice Bible says, now help me remember. Let's get this settled. State your case and prove to me that you're right. This is how God is talking to us. And it's so exciting that we read other translations too. We're bold when we pray, and God loves it. The Holy Spirit will help us when we pray. We come boldly to God. The Holy Spirit will help us to say what he wants us to say. Have you ever sometimes um, were surprised at some things that you would do or, or some things that would, you know, come out of your mouth uh, when, you, when you began to be a little bit bold? I went to uh, another state after graduating from Ramah to kind of help a young couple start a church there. They had no experience, and I was a pastor's wife for years, so I did have some experience. And this church, you know, really started to grow. And one of the ladies in the church was really mentally disturbed. And we tried to help her a lot, you know. And uh, one day she called me. The church was having a, a meeting, an evening meeting. The pastor was not there. He was in another town. So I come was in charge. And so she called me and she says, I'm going to take my life. I'm just done with it all and hung up. I thought, oh, dear me. There I was all dressed up in my high heels and everything, and I ran uh, over to her house, and I saw her run to the barn, and she uh, climbed up into the loft, and so here with me, my high heels, I climb up to the loft, and she had a noose there, and she put her head in the noose, and she started to go off the uh, loft, you know, so she could hang herself, jump off, and I leaped and grabbed her and hung on to her while she bit me. She spit on me. She kicked me. She, it was awful. And I said, angels, help me. Help me. Help me. Help me, Holy Spirit. And my feet slipped down between two bales of hay and got me stuck. I mean, I was stuck. You couldn't move me anyway. And I hung on to her for dear life no matter what she did. But she couldn't move me. So she took the noose off her neck and she ran off, and then I got down, and I, uh, when I got down off of there, I went and called the police, and then we had her helped. We put her in some place where she could get her help, but, you know, that's not me. <laughs> How I could have done something like that? 
but it had to be done. And so God was there. He had my back, and he helped me. And the Holy Spirit will help any of us if we just step out and we do what we know we have to do. Sometimes we get in situations, we just have to do it. You know, you can't stand there and think, here she had the noose around her neck. Well, should I go for it, or should I grab her, or what should I do? Or, Lord, help me, what am I going to do? By that time, she'd be dead. You just got to step out and do what your heart tells you to do. This is important. We have the equipment to do the job. We have the equipment. So we need to pray for the boldness. Quit looking at yourself from the natural standpoint. Quit looking at your physical weaknesses, your shortcomings, all of that stuff. Realize you are a power pack and you got the goods inside of you, inside of you and it works. Amen. It works. Amen. The Holy Spirit is there to help you. You'd be surprised what you can do. And uh, I know I've been here for how many years? And years and years ago in the 80s, there was a certain pastor in town that did not like me at all. He just didn't like me. But you know what? Every time he had a problem, he always called me because he knew I prayed, and he knew that I got results when I prayed. So he called me up one time, and he says, you know, he says, the, the city that my son is living in, it's on fire. There's fire all around. Could you pray with me, please, that, that he won't, his house won't burn? So I said, okay. Well, I prayed, I'm sure, in a way that he didn't agree with, but he had no problems. He just let me pray. So I pled the blood of Jesus over his home and that no evil or disaster would befall it. And I really prayed, and I didn't hear anything for a couple weeks, and I didn't call and ask. But he finally called me. He says, you know what? Every one of those houses around my son burnt down, and my son's house wasn't even touched. I said, is that right? And every time he got in trouble, he always called me because he knew, you know, I would pray with him. And so, you aren't God. God is God. Neither am I. You know, you do your part, you pray, God will do what he can. This is important to know. Being bold in the things of God. Be bold in God's character. Be meek when it comes to tiny little doctrines. I've seen people fight, get into terrible fights, not speak with each other for years simply because uh, one dunked their child, the other one baptized him or sprinkled him or whatever. They get into arguments over we should be sprinkled or dunked or whatever. I don't get into that. There's people thinking, we're going to have to go through the tribulation. And uh, why get into that? I tell them, you want to go through the tribulation? Go ahead. When the, when the trumpet blows, I'm out of here. I don't care what you're going to do, but I know what I'm going to do. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Just don't turn things into a big, you know, whoop to do That's, There's so many hurting and lost people in the world today, and they need Jesus. But sometimes we have to kick a few doors open, you know, to get started to get involved in the situation. Just be bold enough and, and do it. And I can remember one time years ago in the early 90s, some people came to me and said, there's a certain man in a certain city, and uh, he's in a bad way, and, and we really love him, and we appreciate him, and we'd like you to go talk to him. And I said, well, I don't even know him. He said, well, we'd, would you just go? Just do it for us. I said, all right. So I went, and this man was very ill, and he felt that God put it on, that sickness on him, in order to uh, make him grow, and things like that. And no matter how you argued with him, he would not see the light. So finally, I turned around, and I said, well, I'm sorry, I'm just going to go. I can see that I'm not doing you any good. I turned around, and all of a sudden, something came on me, and I turned, whirled around, and I pointed my finger at him, and I said, you don't change your attitude. You don't get in the Bible and see what God says, you're going to die. I turned around and walked out the door, and I thought, oh, my God, I've just killed that man. <laughs> I, he's probably devastated. He's hurt. He's all of this stuff. But, you know, two weeks later, later he comes marching through the door with his wife, and he walked up to me, and he said, you know, I'm healed and I'm whole. Amen. He said, you shook me up, but he said, I got into the Bible, and I found out you were right. I said, well, good for you. They became very good members over years until they finally moved. 
But I'll tell you, God is good. He is good. Very good. And he needs us. Now, does that sound weird to you? John Wesley once said, God can do nothing for mankind unless mankind prays. We give God permission to do things on the earth as we pray. You know, we're free will beings. He doesn't come in like the devil. Push doors open. You ever see that picture of Jesus knocking on the door? And they, and they talk about knocking on the door of your heart. Did you ever notice that he doesn't have a knob on his side? Did you ever notice that? The knob's on the other side. In other words, he's knocking on the door. Please let me in. He can't get in. You have to turn the knob. You have to let him in. I loved that picture. I loved it. I saw that picture as a little child. But when you realize the power that's within you, greater is Jesus in you than the devil that's in the world. And we're to be used mightily of God. We're to be used mightily of God. Um, in the 70s, uh, my husband and I pastored a little denominational church in Fairbank, Iowa. And uh, he was sent there when he graduated. And um, it was a town like Superior. And uh, he, he got that church up to about 250 people. And we had a large upper room and where we had our youth group, and we had about 50 young people, and I'm the one that taught the young people, and I had just gotten filled with the Holy Ghost, with speaking in tongues and all of this stuff, and I was so on fire for God, and I was getting materials that talked about the authority that we have in the name of Jesus and all of this stuff, and I started teaching those kids, those teenagers, all of that. And so one night, uh, you know, we'd let them go. At night during the winter, it'd be dark out, and they'd walk home, I went over to the parsonage, his phone rang, and uh, one of the parents called. She's kind of hysterical. And she said, Mrs. Beauty? She says, oh, she says, are you, are you the one teaching on the name of Jesus? And I thought, here we go, persecution, here it comes, you know. And uh, I said, well, yes, I am. And she said, oh, thank God, thank God. She says, my daughter, she, when she came home, on her way home, a man grabbed her, pulled her into the bushes and was going to molest her. And she said, in the name of Jesus, let me go. And he just completely let her go. And then she ran home. She said, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you're teaching these teenagers. And I thought, praise God, somebody finally understands. And so, you know, we have to step out. I was just new at it. I didn't know much about it. I probably wasn't teaching it all right, but I got the point across. But we just have to do what we have to do. You know, get out of our comfort zone and just step in there and do what we have to do. Um, Job twenty two twenty eight says, Thou shalt decree a thing, it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. You know what? What he's talking about? Your ways. Your ways. We all have different personalities. When we created... When God created us, he threw away the mold. And we all have, each of us has our own way, our own personality. And he uses that personality of yours to reach people. And this is important. So be, be proud of who you are. You may not be, you know, I may not be like Michael. I may not be like Brenda. You ought to thank God for that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but you know what? Uh, you know, we are who we are. And we allow God to use that personality that we've been given and mold it in the way that can be used for his glory. And so this is important for us. So the Holy Spirit will take what Christ has done for you and translate it into your personal victory. That is John 16, 13 through 15 in the Amplified Classified Bible. Let me read it again. The Holy Spirit will take what Christ has done for you and translate into your personal victory, your own personal victory. And so God is a good God. The Passion Bible says in Proverbs 11:8, lovers of God are snatched away from trouble. Isn't that exciting? Lovers of God are snatched away from trouble. Just be proud of who you are. Step out. Kenneth Copeland, one time, after he spoke at a convention, 
a man came up to him and said, you know what, I don't believe a thing you said. My son was killed in a, in a hunting accident. And God doesn't care. That stuff you're preaching is a bunch of bull. And he just got so upset. And Kenneth Copeland just listened and listened. All of a sudden, one of those things happened. Kenneth Copeland whirled around and said, you better change the way you think. You might lose another child. And uh, so uh, a few years later, he gets a letter from this man. This man says, thank God for you, Brother Copeland. Our uh, house has a swimming pool. Our little two-year-old drowned. The paramedics could not bring him alive. It was minutes and minutes and a long time they could not bring him. He said, I remembered your words. He grabbed that child and he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you will come alive. You will come back in Jesus' name. Devil, you are not going to take another child of mine. That little baby, <gasps> he comes back. And he's all right. And he wrote Brother Copeland and he said, Thank God for your boldness. I would have lost another child if it weren't for you. So let's be who God wants us to be. Are you for that? Amen. Amen. Think about that. Let's be all. We're all different. You know, don't look at somebody else and say, I wish I could be like them. You don't want to do that. You want to be like you what God wants you to be, but you're going to have to find out what he wants you to be. So it's important that we remember that. Amen. Amen. God bless you this morning. Let's take communion. What time is it? Did I go overboard? Okay, we'll get out here soon. Call the shots, Kathy. <laughs> Hi. So glad to have you up here. Look at the kitties. I'm going to read from the Living Bible. It's um, chapter 11, First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, <coughs> where's that? Can you see it? Boy, this is small. Can you see this? Looking for 24. 23, 23. Okay, thank you. I can't see the verse. <laughs> for this is what the Lord himself has said about his table, and I have passed it on to you before, that on the night when Judas betrayed him, the Lord Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks to God for it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take this and eat it. This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new agreement between God and you that has been established and set in motion by my blood. Do this in remembrance of me whenever you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are retelling the message of the Lord's death, that he has died for you. Do this until he comes again. So if anyone eats this bread and drinks this cup from this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, he's guilty of sin against the body and the blood of the Lord. That is why a man should examine himself carefully before eating the bread and drinking from the cup. 
For if he eats the bread and drinks from the cup unworthily, not thinking about the body of Christ and what it means, he is eating and drinking God's judgment upon himself, for he is trifling with the death of Christ. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. But if you carefully examine yourselves before eating, you will not need to be judged and punished. Yet when we are judged and punished by the Lord, it is so that we will not be condemned with the rest of the world. So he's talking about not taking uh, these elements unworthily. A lot of people take this as if we're not worthy enough to do communion. Maybe we've committed some kind of a sin. Maybe we're still in the sin, and we should not take this communion. But this is not what this is saying, because what it is actually saying, being unworthy in taking it, is you're taking this without knowing what it really means. A lot of people all over the world, Christians, when they take communion, they don't realize what it means. The bread signifies the body of Jesus Christ, how it was bruised, beaten, mutilated, all of that on the cross. And he did this for us. He did it for us so that we can be healed, totally healed. He doesn't want us to be sick. He took all sickness and everything on himself when he went to the cross. And that's what that bread signifies. And that's what he wants us to realize. If we don't realize that, it does you no good to take communion. Also, the juice represents the blood of Jesus Christ, which was shed for you. You know, your sins were removed um, when the day you uh, asked Jesus into your heart. But every time you make a mistake or sin and you know it, all you have to do is ask for forgiveness. He forgets it. And the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, that's how he forgives. And if you were to ask him, well, you remember I asked you to do this and that? I asked you to forgive this? He'd say, I don't know what you're talking about because he's forgiven it. And so the bread represents the body that was broken for us. The juice represents his precious blood that was shed for us. And so today, as you partake, we have these little uh, cups with the um, wafers on top of it. And we're going to take it. Um, I want you to, we're going to do something just a little bit different. I want you to watch me as Kathy is playing after everybody is served. We'll all take it together, and I'll give you instructions as to what to do. Would you give me one? a little film on the top. If you pull it back, you see the wafer. <coughs> you may have to help the children with that. See, this little round wafer represents the bread. The bread represents the body of Jesus. You know, the thing I like about these wafers, I mean, people take different communion different ways all over the world, but one of the things I like about the wafers is when you um, crush it, you can hear it break. And to me, I can hear the bones of my Jesus break as he's being abused and mutilated. This just gets to me every time. And this is what he's saying in his word. You're not taking this unworthily unless you're not knowing what you're doing. You've got to understand what this signifies, what it means, what the blood means, what the juice means, what the, the bread means, all of this. Then when you know what it means, you're not taking it unworthily. So could you help her with that? Or do, does she have it? Do you have that, honey? Open? Good. All right. So I want you to listen carefully. This wafer, wafer represents the body of Jesus Christ that was broken for you, mutilated. He took it all, so we don't have to take anything. He wants us to be free of sickness and disease. 
free of hurt, free of harm. You know, the world is full of all this stuff. We don't have to be because Jesus already did it. It's a done deal. So let's crack it together and just remember, these are his, represents his bones breaking. And then, the juice represents his precious blood, which was shed for you for the remission of your sins. If I can get this open here. Yeah, my fingers. My fingers don't work that right yet. If you need help, just ask somebody for help. Precious, precious blood. Do you realize this represents his blood? Amen. Shed for you and me. Awesome, awesome. Let's partake. Now, if any of you right now are experiencing any pain in your body, you have any sickness, anything going on in your body right now, I want you to listen to me carefully. I want you to stand. I don't want anybody praying for you. Just follow my instructions, okay? Also, if you're in some type of sin or you're struggling with some things, nobody knows what's going on with you, and they don't have to know. But if you're struggling on the inside of you with something between you and God, he wants to take care of that too. I want you to stand also with that. I don't want anybody going to pray for you. Stand up if you're having a problem. We're going to use our own faith. Amen. Anybody else? Okay, I want you to lift your hands before the Lord. And I want you to just um, begin thanking God now. Do you, do you realize what happened here today? Jesus took all this stuff for us shed his blood, broke his body. All of these things happen so that we don't have to go through this, so that we can be well, we can be healed. So it's a done deal. It's already been done. So now what you do is you start thanking him that it's done. If you have a bad back, you just start thanking him. Lord, I thank you for my healed back. I thank you that my back is well. I don't care how you're feeling. I don't care if you're in pain right now. You start to thank him because it's a done deal. It's a done deal. If you're having problems with some kind of sin in your life, just say, thank you, Father. I, that no longer has a hold of me. I'm, I'm, it's broken from away from me. Begin to thank him that what you're going through right now, it's over and done with. Begin to thank him. And from this day forward, you thank him. I don't care how long it takes. You keep thanking him that it's done till it gets down on the inside of you and, and it's just there and you know that you know that you know that's when the pain will leave, that's when it will go away, but you have to hang on to that faith. Exercise your faith. You can do it yourself. You can right now as you're believing God for yourself. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we just praise you. Praise you, praise you, praise you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I just thank you. I thank you, Father, that the, the feeling will come back in my fingers. I just thank you, Father. It's come back. I thank you, Father. My fingers are healed and whole. Thank you, Lord God. I praise you for that. I'm so excited. I can do anything that I want to do again. I can turn pages again. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm so glad. I'm so glad it's done. And just begin to praise him. Thank you, Lord. It's done. It's done. It's done. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Somebody else in here today uh, has trouble with their hands. You don't have to acknowledge. I'm not going to acknowledge you, but you begin to thank God that I don't know what it is, a thumb or whatever it is. Begin to thank God. That thumb will work in Jesus' name. Amen. That thumb will work. Thank you, Lord. Oh, just treat it like, oh, I'm so glad you're well. Oh, I'm so glad that you're healed and whole. Thank you, Jesus. And you're just, the pain's about to kill you. But you're just saying, thank you, Lord. Oh, I'm so glad that it's healed. I'm so glad. That is what brings the results. 
when you believe God's word, you believe his word, that his word is true, not what you're feeling, not anything like that, but just thanking God that it's a done deal. And uh, who else? Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, this sounds ridiculous, but, but your rear end, somebody is having trouble with their rear end. That's the only way I know how to, to say it. Someone's having trouble. I don't know what's wrong, but begin to thank God that it's done and over with. And if you know what the problem is, just say it out loud to yourself. You know, I thank you, Lord, that rear end is healed. I thank you that that, that ache or that pain or, or that mole or whatever it is, you know, it, that's infected. Uh, it's gone, it's gone, it's healed, it's whole. Just begin to thank him and praise him and thank him and praise him and thank him and praise him. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That is your faith that's being activated right now. It is your faith, you know. You're on a, you're on a desert with nobody around. Something goes wrong with you. Is there anybody around to pray for you? No. So you got to learn how to pray for yourself, you know. Realize that. Now, there are times when we need the body of Christ. Don't be ashamed of asking for prayer or having hands laid on you. But you need to learn how to get it yourself, too. Amen. So I believe that's what you've learned today. So hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you so much. Praise your name. Praise your name. Praise your name. We have a few prayer requests that we'd like to uh, pray about. So if you just wait a couple more minutes before I dismiss. I understand that Pastor John, when he was getting out of a boat, he uh, skinned his leg pretty bad. And uh, he wants us to pray it will not get infected and it will heal quickly. And then, uh, you know, Debbie, what is her last name? De that blonde Debbie that was in our play that was so hilarious, Christmas play. Arix. Okay, Debbie Arix. Her back. She's having back surgery Tuesday, I think at 10 o'clock, something like that. I found out about it myself, so I called her and asked her, you know, if she wanted us to pray, and she said fine. So uh, anybody else has a prayer request? Yes. Sharon? Uh-huh. Um, Who? Danielle Matthews' mom. Mom. Marlene. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm not getting this. Marlene is her name. Okay. Oh. Yes. Okay, anybody else? Anybody? Yes. Okay, what is his name? Evan? Okay, anybody else? Kathy? Surgery on her back and her eyes? Both of them? Same sister? Okay. And I'm having sur surgery on my skin on my neck. Carotid artery? Okay, just a minute. Surgery and back. Anybody else? Yes, Nancy. Um, I have a coworker who needs 
Yes, Roy. Brooks. I'll just put Brooks S. <laughs> Hit by a car. Oh. Okay, anybody else? Okay, Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up Pastor John to you. We thank you. Uh, Your word says that um, you've healed us and uh, caused us to be whole. And um, you've healed us of our wounds, according to um, Jeremiah 30, 17. We just thank you for that, Lord. There will be no infection in that wound. It will... uh, Stab over and it will heal quickly in Jesus' name. And there will be no infection. We refuse infection in Jesus' name. And then Debbie Atrix, uh, we pray for her back surgery, Lord, that the surgeon's hands will be totally guided and everything will be done the way it should be done because this will be an operation that will be helped by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be in charge of this situation. We just thank you and we praise you for that in the name of Jesus. And Lord, We lift up Marlene's mom having surgery. We thank you for a successful surgery, that the surgeon's hands are anointed, and uh, what goes on in that surgical room will be entirely of God, and it will come out successfully, and we praise you and thank you for it. And Lord, we pray for Evan. We just rebuke that cough in the name of Jesus. It has to go. His chest will be normal, and and his breathing will be normal, and that cough will be gone. We rebuke it. With the name of Jesus, that name is above every name. And we thank you and praise you that that little boy is healed. And we lift up uh, Kathy Roder's sister, her surgery on her back and her eyes. We just thank you also, Father, that the surgeon's hands are guided. They will be directed by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit knows exactly what's going on. Sometimes even when the doctors do not know, the Holy Spirit knows and he will take charge of that situation. And she will be healed and whole in Jesus' name. And we lift up Kathy, wrote her, her, uh, wrote her to you, Lord. And uh, she has carotid artery surgery. And Lord, we just, um, we just thank you that God has not given her a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. We just thank you. Her heart is at ease. Her body is at ease. And it will be a totally successful surgery. It will take care of the problem. And she will be healed and whole in Jesus' name. And also... We lift up Brooks S. that was hit by the car. We thank you, Father God, that uh, you sent your word and healed us and delivered us from our destructions. That was the destruction, and God will take care of that. Every single thing that's wrong with him, every bone that's broken, every, every tear, everything will go back together beautifully, whether through surgery or medicine or whatever. He will be totally restored to health in Jesus' name. And I thank you and praise you, Father. Also, I just ask that his family be positive. You encourage the people to be positive, that he will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. And we thank you for that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Don, I pray for you that you can read my writing. Don Wiest, I'm praying for you that you can read my writing. God bless you all. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, yes. We need to, we realize we're on Facebook. So we have an audience on Facebook. And I just want to say to them, I'm so glad that you joined us this morning. We love it. We love being on Facebook. We love reaching other people. And, you know, if there's anybody here, which I know most of you, if anybody's here, Anybody on Facebook that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, this is a beautiful time to take care of that because God doesn't want anybody in hell. He wants them in heaven. That's a place he's prepared for us. 
He wants you to be there. But the decision is up to you. You have to make that decision. You just don't automatically go there. The Bible says there's only one way to get to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ, by making him your Lord and your Savior. And so I just pray that you do that today. I'd like to say a little prayer. I'd like you to join with me. And if you prayed that prayer, that means that Jesus has moved in. He's a part of you, and he has saved you, and you are on your way to heaven someday. So just pray this prayer with me. Say, Dear Jesus, come into my heart. I want you to be my Savior. I want you to be my Lord. I've asked you in. So now you're in. I'm a part of the body of Christ. And I love you. Help me to walk with you. Help me to do what you want me to do. Help me to be what you want me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. If you truly meant that prayer, you would have a home here if you'd like to have it. We'd love to have you. But wherever you are, whatever church that you're going to, the most important thing in the world is knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. So God bless you today. We are dismissed. <laughs>